They say history is written by the winners, but when it comes to spies and spy masters, the failures often tell us more. Of all its responsibilities, the most important task facing a nation's intelligence service is to warn of imminent attack. Never more so than in today's high-speed world. The most devastating weapon of the 20th century has been surprise attack. As we move through the 20th century, states increasingly go to war without declaring war on each other. And instead, they turn to new weapons, new ways of war to take their enemies unawares. And in most cases, this is successful. This film explores three stories of powerful nations caught off guard. Before 9-11, America's leaders failed to take on board the possibility that terrorists might try to crash planes into buildings inside the United States. The notion that something like 9-11 could happen was not an alien thought to a number of people who were deeply involved in watching Al-Qaeda over a period of time. Sixty years earlier, when the British suffered their own Pearl Harbor, it was the arrogance of empire that led Britain's generals to drop their guard. The general impression of the Japanese armed forces were that they were not much good. They were all undersized, they had bad eyesight, um, and we, we, we thought they were a pushover. Even the world's most renowned intelligence services have been caught napping. In 1973, Israel's border with its main enemy, Egypt, ran along the Suez Canal. It was one of the most heavily fortified areas on Earth. On the 6th of October, many of the Israelis patrolling the canal were reservists doing their annual military service. One of them, Avi Yaffe, a sound technician in civilian life, had his tape recorder with him. At 1.53, my battalion commander came on the radio. He said, go out and let me know if you can hear the sound of engines. I went out, and at that very moment the bombing began. The ground shook. The war had begun. But Israel was not ready for war. This would prove to be the greatest intelligence blunder in its history. In the next days, its very survival would be in the balance. of the intelligence failure lay in Israel's great victory over its Arab enemies six years before. The hero today of the Jewish peoples, General Moshe Dayan, an architect of the swiftest, most overwhelming victory of all time. In just six days in 1967, Israel had crushed the armies of Jordan, Syria and Egypt and tripled the size of its territory. From Egypt, it had seized the entire Sinai Desert. Now its territory ran right up to the Suez Canal, little more than a hundred miles from the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Our victory was beyond our wildest expectations. Now people felt we could defeat the Arabs, no matter what, and with minimum effort. Israel rejoiced at its victory. But in its newfound confidence lay the seeds of catastrophe. In 1970, three years after its humiliating defeat by Israel, Egypt got a new president, Anwar Sadat. He was forever claiming that his armies would soon take their revenge against Israel. Our intelligence people said that Sadat had no charisma, and they said that he was incapable of deciding anything. He was seen as a bit of a joke. 
but Anwar Sadat was deadly serious. In 1971, he went to Moscow to ask Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev to help him modernize Egypt's air force. And Israel's spies reported his every word. Our foreign intelligence service Mossad had a high-ranking Egyptian spying for them. He passed us documents which described in detail Sadat's discussions with Brezhnev. It was reliable information. And it told us that the Egyptians believed that they needed new weapons before they could attack Israel. Sadat wanted the Russians to provide him with an air force to match Israel's. This made perfect sense to me because Egypt wanted to reconquer the Sinai, which is a desert. But they could not hope to win a desert war as long as we had control of the skies. Israel's intelligence chief got good news. The Russians refused Egypt's request for new aircraft. So Israel was safe from Egyptian attack. Or so they thought. But Sadat was determined. Egypt would have to find a way without Russian planes. We were at the president's house and he outlined the situation. Then he said, for the very first time, he even said in English, to be or not to be. To be or not to be. We can't delay any longer. We'll go to war with what we have. Egypt's chief of staff was required to come up with a war plan which required no new weapons. Our plan was to go only about 12 kilometers into the Sinai, no further. Everything else followed from that. By advancing only 12 kilometers and stopping, the Egyptians aimed to establish a foothold in the Sinai desert while staying inside the protective cover of their anti-aircraft missiles. We'd make up for the weakness of our air force by deploying SAM missiles. Then we wouldn't need a strong air force. This time, Egypt kept its plan secret from Israel's spies. So from then on, Israel's reading of Egypt's war plan was out of date. The Israeli army only thought in terms of Egypt launching all-out war. Neither the army nor the intelligence service ever considered that Egypt might change its plan. To succeed, the Egyptians needed to move a huge army to the canal without alarming Israel. From their lookout posts, Israeli troops could see every movement on the other side. The Egyptians could not hide their troops, so they set out to hide their intentions. Between October 72 and October 73, we mobilized our forces 23 times. So the enemy got used to our troops moving back and forth. In April 1973, Israel's spies warned that Egypt really was about to attack. Only the head of military intelligence, General Zaira, dismissed the warning. All the same, the chief of staff called up the reserves, but there was no war. Then people said, why did you do that when the head of intelligence told you there'd be no war? This greatly strengthened Eliezer's position and prestige. After that, whenever this question came up, no one dared to contradict him. Israel's generals were now convinced by General Zaira's doctrine that Egypt would not attack until it had the necessary air power. In Washington, the CIA was not so sure. By mid-September, they were growing suspicious of Egypt's intentions. The CIA analyst, and I was one of those analysts, thought it was time to use the liaison channel with Israel, and we got back a response that was kind of severe in terms of, we think you're overreacting. Uh, we think this is a very extreme interpretation of the intelligence. And this had a tremendous impact on CIA's Arab analysts, the ones who covered uh, the Middle East, that if the Israelis, if they're not 